crazy. I sat down yesterday to prepare the sermons and they just started coming. Sometimes I wait a while and I pray and the Lord always delivers me a sermon, even if it's the next morning. He always gives me something, but yesterday he was giving me a whole lot real fast and I was typing as fast as I could. The problem with that is when you get to the pulpit, what do I preach? Because I have four different thoughts going through my head. And I was so sure I was going to preach this one until just 30 seconds ago when I opened up my binder and looked down and saw the other. So I decided to flip it. And I'm going to go ahead and preach based upon something Tommy said to me yesterday. Uh, he talked about a verse of scripture and he said, did you read this? He actually sent it to me and I read what he sent. And that verse that he sent is the second verse I have listed here in my points. So I couldn't help but think about that. So my message today is entitled, Seven Up, the Ancola. Now you say, what in the world? Okay, I had to come up with a title because I couldn't think of anything else. But it's the title on the uns. UNS. So I thought, what can I say? Can I entitle this unholy? Can I entitle this unclean? Can I entitle this unblameable? What do I entitle it? So for you older folks in here that may remember the marketing slogan by 7up, it went by 7up the uncola. Who knows what I'm talking about? Put your hands up. Who has no idea of that slogan? That's what I thought. <laughs> so if you're 30 and older, you know what the Uncola is. And they really made a good slogan when you think about it, because what they said is, we're not a cola. We're the Uncola. We're seven up. We're clear. We're not like those sugary, sappy cola drinks. We are the Uncola. And it was seven up the Uncola. So the Un was cola versus no cola. And that was great because people say, well, I don't want all that sugary Pepsi and Coke and Dr. Pepper and all that cola stuff. I'll go with something lighter. When they realized they were getting the same amount of sugar, right? <laughs> but it was clear and it was good and it was wholesome for you. Seven up, oh, the Uncola, this is a healthy drink. It wasn't healthy. All they did was say, we're not one of them, but you were, you just were clear. But boy, they made a lot of money on that uncola thing. So today I'm going to talk about some of the words that have UN in front of them in the scripture. And some of them are bad. And some of them actually are good when you think about it. So when you're taking something away from un, again, my text here, the uncola, we're going to take the cola away, that sugary, sappy, dark stuff. And we're going to be the un-cola, better than the cola, okay? So today, I want you to turn, and this is based upon my sermon on Wednesday, how one kind of segued into this, let him, that is unjust, be unjust still, okay? And the Lord then flips and says, let him that is righteous, be righteous still. And as I said on Wednesday, there are just some people who are content being unjust. They will not repent. They just won't come to the truth. They won't do it. No matter how much you preach to them, no matter what you say, no matter what the Lord does in their life, they just will not repent and they just won't come. And the Lord has given so many invites, as I said in Sunday school, all day long have I stretched forth my hand unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. And how many Americans are going to go to hell because they just refuse to give up their unjust way of life, their ungodly and unrighteous way of life. They just will not repent and they're going to go to their grave with the way they live. This is the way I am. And have we heard people say, well, that's what I believe and I'm going to take it to my grave. Or this is the way I've been my whole life, and I'm not about to change now. Oh, man's his own worst enemy, isn't he? 
Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. The Bible says, let, and before we read this, I'll quote something. Let favor be shown to the wicked. Okay? Let favor be shown to the wicked. Yet will he not learn the way of righteousness. Think about that verse. How much favor has been shown towards the wicked? And think about our country. Think about the world. How much God has given to wicked people and has not judged them here on earth. Let favor be shown to the wicked, yet will he not learn the ways of righteousness. You ought to praise God you're saved. You ought to praise God that you repented of your sins and you came to the Lord as your Savior. Okay, Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22 and verse number 11. The scripture says, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. So God's basically saying here, you want it that way? Then it's going to be that way. You want to be unjust and remain unjust. You want to be filthy? Then be filthy. But praise God on the other side of the coin. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Now, I, I chose a couple words. And one word I chose, which is a real biblical word, and some of you may not know what the word means, but it actually means satisfied. What's the Bible word for the word satisfied? What's another word in the Bible for satisfied? Satiated. Satiated. So for you that don't understand all the words in the Bible, when you read the word satiated or satiated, that is satisfied. Now, God does use the word satisfied as well in the Bible. But satiated is the one that he uses quite a bit. And there are people that are satisfied, satiated. And there are those that are unsatiated. Okay, so we got that un going on there. We got satiated, I'm satisfied, I'm good. But you take those two letters UN and you put it in front of there, and you have someone who's not satisfied. Not satisfied. And there are a lot of people today that aren't satisfied. The Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain. The Lord wants us to be thankful and to be satisfied with what we have. Not unsatisfied, because unsatisfied leads to a world of unhappiness. And it'll take your joy away. Let's go to Ezekiel ch chapter 16. This is in regard to Israel being compared to a promiscuous woman. Ezekiel and get Jeremiah as well. Ezekiel chapter 16 and Jeremiah chapter 31. Human nature has always been the same from the beginning. It's no different today. Though man thinks it's different, it's the same as it always was. When Adam and Eve fell, human nature remained the same. The things that were in them are the same things that are in us. The wickedness that comes forth out of, out of the heart is the same wickedness that came out from the beginning. No different. Jeremiah chapter 31 and look in verse number 10. Jeremiah 31 verse 10. Question is today, are you satisfied? We sing the song satisfied. Out of that blue hymnal, satisfied. Today, are you satisfied? Is your heart satisfied with what you have, your lot in life, where you are, your salvation, your family, your church, your, your job, your vehicle, the talents God's given you? He gave us that. He wants us to be satisfied with those things. Jeremiah 31, verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles of far off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him, and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob, and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion, and shall flow together to the goodness of the Lord. For wheat, and for wine, and for oil. How about our hunger? Anybody in here hungry today? 
You say, I'm, oh, yeah, you might be hungry. You say, I didn't get breakfast. I'm starving. Are you really starving? Don't we use that kind of loosely? I'm starving. I've heard the, my grandkids all the time. Pappy, I'm starving. Well, what do you want me to do about it? I'm starving. Why do they tell me? <laughs> Go cry to your mom. Go cry to your dad. But we're starving. I got to do something about their starving. They're starving. They need to eat. Now, you're hungry, but you're not starving. And for those that are hungry, aren't you going to leave church today? And don't you have a freezer or a refrigerator full of food? Say no. Well, can't you go right up to the fast food place and get something to satisfy your hunger? Have money in your wallet, you could satisfy yourself. There's no want for wheat. There's no want for food, is there? Boy, we satisfied, huh? Okay, now, but yet people who have all that sometimes aren't satisfied. For wheat and for wine and for oil and for the young of the flock and of the herd, and their souls shall be as a watered garden, and they shall not sorrow any more at all. You see, their soul is as a watered garden, fruitful content, full, right? That's how our soul should be. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, both young men and old together, for I will turn their mourning into joy and will comfort them and make them rejoice from their sorrow. Now God can satisfy. Amen. Verse 14, and I will satiate the soul of the priests with fatness. See, a satisfied soul. Is your soul satisfied? And my people shall be satisfied. And I'll tell you this. For those that knock the King James Bible, it's its, own, it's its own dictionary. If you didn't know what the word satiate mean, God told you that in the same verse. He gave you the other word. The word satiate. He broadened your vocabulary. He gave you two words. Satiate. Satisfy. They're the same word. And be satisfied with my goodness, saith the Lord. God does that quite a bit to difficult words when you don't understand. Look in the text. Look in the verse before, the verse after, and the Bible's its own dictionary. Its own th thesaurus, if you will. You look up the word satiate, and you'll see immediately satisfy. You work up, look up the word satisfy, and you'll see satiate. There it is, a sister word to it. Now you got more in your vocabulary. You're broadening your wisdom and your understanding. Okay, he'll satisfy your soul. Now, this, this word satiate is associated in the book of Ezekiel to a woman who's not content with her lot in life, is not content with her husband. Okay, and a lot can go wrong when you're not content with your spouse. A lot can go wrong. Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel ch chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter 16. And let's look in verse 25. Let's look in verse 20, 22. Let's go 22, okay? This is Israel in the eyes of God. And remember, God the Father and Israel were married. And in the book of Isaiah, you'll read that God the Father wrote a bill of divorcement, signed it, God, and gave it to Israel. And he divorced Israel. And the reason he did that was because in his eyes, Israel was not satisfied with their marriage to God. Imagine that. Israel, the nation of Israel, God compared to a woman, and God, the father, being the husband, they were married. God was happy, but yet she wasn't. And what did it cause her to do? She ended up running around on God. And she doted on what the Bible says were her lovers because she was not satisfied. Today I ask, are you satisfied? You say, well, life has dealt me a tough blow. 
But yet understand this, not all the time is life going to satisfy you. But who will? When you can't find satisfaction in the world and in life, you can always find it where? In Christ. And this is where I, when I preach and I tell, and I preach to myself, the world will leave you dry. It'll leave you longing for things. But yet our wicked hearts want that. And we find ourselves so quickly wanting to leave what satisfied us to go back to what didn't. We find ourselves over here gleaning in the fields like the prodigal son. And ultimately, where does it lead? It leads to the hog slop. That's where the world, the end leads. The prodigal son, that whole little story, one of the most wonderful short stories ever said by anybody. He left the father. He had it all. Give me my inheritance. Give me what's coming to me. And he went. And what did he do? He squandered it with riotous living and with harlots. And before he knew what happened, he found himself so low that he desired the food that the pigs were eating. And he said, what am I doing? As he looked around, give me that. What am I doing? How far he had fallen, didn't he? What did he do? Said, I'll go and return. I'll go back to the Father. Let's go Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel 16 and look in verse, what I say, 22. And in all thine abominations and thy whoredoms, thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth. When thou wast naked and bare and wast polluted in thy blood. And it came to pass after all thy wickedness. Woe, woe unto thee, saith the Lord God. That thou hast also built unto thee an eminent place. And hath made thee an high place in every street. Thou hast built thy high place at the every head. At every head of the way. And hast made thy beauty to be abhorred. And has opened thy feet to everyone that passed by. You see the looseness? And multiplied thy whoredoms. Thou hast also committed fornication with the Egyptians, thy neighbors, great of flesh, and has increased thy whoredoms. Revoke me to anger. Behold, therefore, I have stretched out my hand over thee, and have diminished thine ordinary food, and delivered thee unto the will of them that hate thee. The daughters of the Philistines, which are ashamed of thy lewd way. Thou hast played the whore also with the Assyrians, because thou wast, here it is, unsatiable. He was not satisfied, nor could be. Yea, thou hast played the harlot with them, and yet couldst not be satisfied. Thou hast moreover multiplied thy fornication in the land of Canaan unto Chaldea, yet thou wast not satisfied herewith. So what's it telling you? Sin does not what? Sin won't satisfy. It just won't satisfy. You say, yeah, but pastor, I'm tempted and I, and I give in a little bit. Yeah, but when you give in a little bit, what do you want to do? It's not enough. It's not enough. It's not enough. I need more. I need more. It's like Big Bertha at the, at the uh, county fair or at the carnival. Remember? You throw the balls into her mouth. Feed me. I'm hungry. Oh, 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 oh. Feed me. Can't throw them in fast enough. More. Oh, 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 oh. More. I'd say, come on, kids, get the balls in the mouth. Help me. Feed me. I'm hungry. One ball wasn't enough for her. I need more, I need more, I need more. What's God say about all that? The reason I went here is because I want you to understand there's a certain weakness in all of us. 
But yet some people have a heart that's weaker than others. And the problem of the matter, as one person once told me, and I wrote it down in my Bible, the problem of the matter is the problem of the heart. And he said it this way, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. When you get the heart right, everything else follows. So look what God says in the end. Verse number 30, uh, 29. Thou hast moreover multiplied thy fornication in the land of Canaan unto Chaldea, and yet thou wast not satisfied herewith. Look what he says. How weak is thine heart, saith the Lord God, seeing thou doest all these things, the work of an imperious, whorish woman. He says, how weak, how weak is your heart? And today, how weak is your heart? Now, the verse that Tommy sent me yesterday and the verse that I got a blessing out of and the verse that I compared, I said, man, I just got this and I got this text. And he asked me later, did you get this? And it came right after I got this. Un, as in uncola, cola. We have unsatiate. Next, we have unholy and unclean. Unholy and unclean. Leviticus chapter 10, and this was the verse, Leviticus chapter 10. And he sent me the message and he said, Pastor, this deals with drinking and it deals with unholiness. Leviticus chapter 10 and verse number eight. And the Lord spake unto Aaron saying, do not drink wine nor strong drink. Now there was a reason that God didn't want those priests and their sons to drink. It says, do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. The reason you didn't want that is because God wanted to put a difference in verse 10, and that you may put difference between holy and unholy. And as I preached last week about some of the ways of the world and some of the dress of the world and some of the actions of the world, especially in the house of the Lord, when we come into the house of the Lord, what should be represented here? holiness and anything that's unholy should not be here now over the years we've had people come into our congregation who have been drunk it's not been members it's been visitors and everybody knows because those sitting next to them will go and they'll look away and i get it I know immediately from the actions of the people that they know that person is intoxicated and that person's in the house of the Lord. So as the pastor, I got a real dilemma. I have a visitor who's drunk. Now, should I tell that visitor, leave, you're drunk. Should I have grace? There was a great preacher. His name was Billy Sunday. Anybody know, know him? He was about 450 pounds. I heard him preach when I was a kid. And man, could he preach. And could he ever sing? He could sing and preach. And man, what he'd preach, he'd just make you laugh. That guy was so funny. But he wasn't always that way. Billy Sunday was a, I'm sorry, not Billy Sunday, Billy Kelly, my fault, Billy Kelly. And a lot of Billies that were preachers. Billy Sunday wasn't a great guy either before he got saved. He was a baseball player, but he was somewhat of a drunk himself. But Billy Kelly, Billy Kelly could sing and he could preach. Who ever heard Billy Kelly? Okay. 
You say, well, he wasn't always that way, Pastor. No, he wasn't. In fact, Billy Kelly was a drunk. And Billy Kelly got drugged one night to the church and he went up in the bell tower and he fell asleep. And while he was sleeping from his stupor, services were about to go on. And as they began to sing, Billy Kelly woke up from his stupor. And the preacher got up and he began to preach. And Billy Kelly, being that drunk that he was, was up there and he had nowhere to go. He was in the bell tower. So he said, I'll listen. And he listened and he listened and he listened. And guess what? Conviction came on him. The Holy Spirit got a hold of him. And the Holy Spirit just began to wrung his heart, squeeze it and press it, and begin to convict him. And when the altar call was called, guess who come out of the bell tower? That 400 pounder. And guess who rolled down the aisle? Still half intoxicated. And guess who got to the altar? And guess who cried and weeped and mourned and begged God to forgive him and save him? That old drunk, Billy Kelly. And you know what happened? God cleaned him up. And God showed him a difference between holy and unholy. Between godly and ungodly. Between righteousness and unrighteousness. And God saved him. And God called him. And that man went on to preach until the day he died. And many, many, many got saved and got right because of the preaching and singing of Billy Kelly. Look him up on the internet later and take a look and hear him sing and hear him preach. The man could preach, but he wasn't always that way. You see, God wants us to know the difference between holy and unholy. God wants us to know the difference between godly and the difference between ungodly. And that goes down to actions, behaviors, dress, talk, everything we do. The Bible says, let all be done to the glory of God. It says in verse 10 that you may put difference between holy and unholy and between unclean and clean, and that ye may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord hath spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. Unthankful, unholy, unclean, ungodly. And in the end, all of this makes us another un. It makes us unfruitful. That sower that sows the word, you remember what falls among the thorns? What happens? It grows up into a nice tender plant. And it's starting to bring forth some fruit. And all of a sudden, the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in does what? Chokes the word. And it becometh unfruitful. The weeds begin low, don't they? And they wrap around and they wrap around. And as they come up, they tighten like a boa constrictor. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches. A python won't get you with one coil. He'll latch on. Normally they grab their prey and they've grabbed men and killed men. They grab them right up near the shoulder. Get them from behind, they grab a hold, and their teeth come in. Just small teeth, but they're in. And the more you pull, the deeper they go, and it hangs on. Cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things, the love of money. Grabs a hold, and then it begins to go around. It won't get you with one coil. A second coil, a third coil, what happens? Before you know it, you can't breathe. You know, iniquity, there are th there's, sin is called sin, iniquity, and transgression. If I say God draws a line, God draws a line here, he says don't cross this line. And when you cross the line, you're transgressing, right? 
Sin is an action. With this iniquity, that's another word for sin. Iniquity has what to it? It has weight. And it has depths. That's why sin makes you go further and further and further and further and further. You can't feel the chains of sin until they're too strong to be broken. I'm thankful, unholy, ungodly, unrighteous leads to unfruitful. So is un always bad? No. How about this? We are now for the good stuff. And Pastor, you weighed me down. You weighed me down. My head is down in my neck like a turtle. You weighed me down. I can't breathe, Pastor. Help me. Okay, we are unblameable. You say, Pastor, but you just put us over here in all this slop. Why are we unblameable? Enter Jesus Christ. Oh, if it weren't for his blood, huh? Amen. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. Amen. Forgive me. I don't see a thing. Amen. <laughs> Need I say those rose-colored glasses? Pastor Jim. I don't see a thing. I'm blameable. But the devil says, look at him. Look at what they did. I can't see. What do you mean? It's there. It's covered. All I see is the blood. We should have had everybody standing up. Do we not have a sinner amongst us? You ever hear that? Secret sins. You know what they are. I know what they are. No one else does. Because I got them hid. They're secret. No, they're not. Because... He that is higher than the highest regardest. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. The devil sees them. Look at those secret sins. They put on a halo. They look good to everybody else. Look at what they did. I could just hear his, his serpentine voice. Look at what they did. And God says, Sorry, Satan, I just can't see them. They're under the blood. Unblameable. Colossians 1. Colossians 1. And then you'll like the next un, too. Because if you're blameable, the Lord can really pass judgment on you. But the other un takes care of that, too. Let's go to Colossians. Colossians 1. Colossians 1, verse 22. There's two ones here. Because if we were blamable, we would be reprovable. It says in 21, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Was that us? Were we sometimes? Yes, we were. And all of us can remember when we weren't saved. Alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Amen. 
Oh, thank God for reconciliation in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and what? Unblameable and unreprovable. Amen. To be reproved deals with judgment. The Lord is not going to pass judgment on our soul because we are unblameable. Therefore, we are unreprovable in his sight. More on unreprovable. Go to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. And then it even goes further with this, with the uns. 1 Thessalonians 3. 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 13. And I'm almost done. Hold the amens. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 12. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Now, I tell you what, when he calls our name out of here, we go and the Lord says, I'm calling you because you're unblameable. You're unreprovable. And finally, what's worse than a reproof? We don't like this. We don't like to be rebuked. You ever been rebuked? You ever have somebody get in your face and rebuke you for something you did and you were wrong? There's either what they call the fight or flight, right? You take it. And you say, oh, I had to punch that guy right in the teeth. I feel, who are you to tell? And they're telling you the honest to God truth. What's the Bible say about rebuke? Open rebuke is better than secret love. If somebody cares about you and has the guts to tell you when you're doing something wrong, they care about you. They care about, you know, nobody likes the truth. Simon Cow. Who is he? Everybody knows American Idol, right? When it first came on, it was a hit. One night I was watching it and I saw Randy and Paula Abdul and this other guy who I didn't know. And the girl got up there, or the guy got up there, and he sang. And, and Randy says, that was good, dog. That was good, dog. And Paula says, yeah, I guess so. And that was so good. And everybody. And Simon Cow, what's your opinion? That was excruciating. Awful. Boo, boo, boo. He told the truth. Nobody liked him. Nobody likes to be rebuked. The teachers in school were your least favorite were the ones who told you the truth, weren't they? Yeah. Greta Gestapo. Those are some names teachers got. Dr. Death. Common name in the Manaka School District. My kids come home, you don't understand. Dr. Death. Why do you call it Dr. Death? Rolls with an iron hand. They remember them the most, don't they? To be rebuked. Would you want God rebuking you at the judgment? But one thing with the uns, we are unblameable, unreprovable, and we are unrebukable. You say, but I deserve it. I know, I do too. At the judgment, we would deserve God to tell us a thing or two. But I, 
plead and I close with this. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ. And through the blood of Jesus Christ, I am unblameable, unreprovable, and I am unrebukable. And I'm going to go home and I'm going to have some uncool. <laughs> Let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. Spencerville, do you want to pray into this? Martino. Okay, Martino's going to close this in prayer. Dear Lord God, I just pray for this day. Uh, I pray for everybody here. Everybody uh, out here that you keep them safe. Safe traveling mercies wherever they got to go, Lord. Keep everybody healthy. Anybody who's not healthy, Lord, uh, please uh, heal them so they can come back here, Lord, and worship you uh, for the sermon today. Uh, just hope we keep that in mind and we can apply it to serve you in our daily lives, Lord. Uh, I pray for people going back to school, uh, college, anything like that, Lord, just keep them safe. Pray for everybody for the work week, Lord. Uh, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So when there's a run on seven up in the area.